Hey everybody, welcome back to Grain Markets and Other Stuff. Thank you for joining me. It is Wednesday, November 25th. Uh, it's about mid-morning here. Kind of slow. I figured I would do a quick update ahead of the Thanksgiving break, uh, run through a couple of things, run through a few things that I'm watching in the markets um, ahead of the holiday here. I haven't had time to do a, a longer form episode this week. Uh, thank you for coming back. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for subscribing. Uh, remember, if you have not already subscribed to Grain Markets and Other Stuff, go on any of the podcast apps out there or go on YouTube and uh, subscribe so you are made aware when new content is available. Um, I have had a couple of questions regarding the Grain Marketing 101 series. I did the first episode there uh, a week or two ago. I'm planning another episode uh, the second uh, edition will be out, I think, either next week or the week after. It, it may be the week after, but sometime here in the next couple of weeks, we'll get back to that. It'll be, again, uh, an evening time slot, and uh, I'll stream live. And we're going to keep doing these every, uh, uh, hopefully every three weeks or so is is kind of the uh, ga uh, game plan here. I am on the mend uh, uh, from COVID. I tested positive for COVID last week i took the test thursday uh tested positive friday uh, my personal experience with it is that it was kind of like uh just some cold symptoms for a couple days um i had the chills real bad one day probably the worst i've ever had that and then it's it just kind of reverted into like a fatigue type thing uh just very tired for several days i've kind of been that way the whole week but i i think i'm i'm on the back side of it certainly hoping to be back a uh, hundred percent by this weekend or so so uh for thanksgiving we've got a quarantine we we would typically have some family over we'd have my parents over but uh it'll be just uh my wife and kids uh this year which is is fine i'd rather not have it this way of course but uh got to keep everybody safe so that's the game plan um i will be smoking a turkey uh which is what i've done the last several years if you've never smoked a turkey um highly recommended uh, a couple of tips if you're going to go that route first off you've got to butterfly the turkey you've got to take the backbone out and kind of fold it out they call it spatchcocking it is what they call it but uh that's the only way you'll be able to smoke a turkey and get it to cook evenly is to uh cut the backbone out and cook it that way and and kind of fold it out um you want to cook it on higher heat i can usually get mine done in three hours three and a half hours you want to cook it at 325 on the smoker um and, and there's no particular amount of time. It all depends on the weight of the bird. And uh, you've got to have a thermometer. So if you have some sort of digital thermometer uh, to, to kind of gauge your progress, um, that's, that's a must. Other than that, I keep it pretty simple. I just do a dry brine uh, the day before, just, just uh, a heavy coat of salt, and that's it. I don't do any wet brines or mess with any of that. And uh, mine have come out really, really good. We've totally gone away from, from ever doing a turkey in the oven. So that's what I'll be doing uh, tomorrow. Um, remember if you have not, I want to cover this because I, I always forget to cover it, um, uh, during the, uh, uh, podcast, but if you have not already subscribed, uh, to my newsletter and you're looking for some assistance with your grain marketing, um, go to my website. It's standardgrain.com. I've got it up on the screen here. Click on grain marketing plan up in the upper right hand corner. Uh, you can subscribe to my newsletter and text message service for $49 a month. And I'll send you my email every morning at 630 central time along with the text message service. I'll let you know exactly what I'm doing in regard to grain marketing. Uh, when I'm pricing corn, when I'm pricing soybeans, when I'm pricing wheat, uh, when I'm rolling futures or HTA positions, um, all that stuff. It's it's 49 bucks a month. You can cancel it at absolutely any time. So uh, make sure you check that out if you have not already. Wanted to run through a few factors that I'm watching in the corn, soybean, and wheat markets as we head into the uh, Thanksgiving break. Um, I'm going to start off with soybeans, and I think there's a, a few things that we've got to be watching here. The first thing is uh, South American weather. Uh, Brazil has been very, very dry. This little area that I'm circling on the map here, this is Mato Grosso, and they've had the driest start to their growing season in like 30 or 40 years. It's It's been phenomenally dry. Um, they do have some rain in the forecast, in the extended forecast, talking like middle of next week. This could be a big deal, um, and, and their soybean growing area goes, you know, all throughout this region and down into southern Brazil down here. But... Um, 
this uh, weather deal coming into next week could be big if, if you were to see a big shift. If, if it shifts wetter um, or, or some of the rains and the extended forecasts are verified, that would perhaps be a negative uh, for the market. If uh, they take some rain out and this forecast looks drier, that's a big positive for the soybean market. And, and you'll get ideas floating around that, um, that Brazil is, or, or that China rather, is going to have to buy more beans um, from the U.S. essentially in order to offset what may not be there in Brazil. This map, I, I should have said, this is um, uh, precipitation versus normal over the last 30 days. And you can see that it's been uh, very, very dry versus uh, normal, certainly. Um, the next thing I wanted to show you uh, is this story about soybean cancellations. And this is the story that uh, Reuters pr had printed this morning. And this was kind of a follow-up to that article that was in um, AgriCensus earlier this week. And the story is the same. I mean, there are some Chinese buyers, some crushers, some processors in China who are probably going to cancel some U.S. soybean purchases. Um, the amounts... Uh, when you read the when you read through the articles, it doesn't sound like the amounts are going to be really phenomenal. Uh, that's not set in stone. This is all just kind of hearsay for the moment. But um, I don't think that the amounts are necessarily huge, and I'm not surprised by this news. I don't think anybody is. When you look at the calendar, when you look at at the price dynamics here of of what's going on in the U.S. versus Brazil, which I'm going to get to in a second. But um, th this is a story that could make some headlines here if it's confirmed, if the amounts are big enough. Uh, this could definitely be a story uh, when we come back from the Thanksgiving break here. Um, I wanted to show you a chart on uh, price dynamics of um, what's going on in the U.S. Uh, versus Brazil. And this is a very crude chart that I have here, but it gives you an idea. These are uh, some uh, prices that I pulled off of the uh, Reuters icon platform. But what you can see here is pretty clear. Um, Brazilian soybeans on the global export market are going to be at a discount to U.S. beans in February. And in February, that early time slot in February, it's not a huge discount. But once you get into March, uh, the forward pricing for Brazil starts to get really cheap compared to the United States. And it, it gets even cheaper into April. So if you were to see cancellations, if you go back to that, that headline regarding soybean cancellations, it would not be surprising because... The, the Chinese know that they'll be able to buy these beans cheaper from Brazil come February and then and then even more so in March and April and beyond that time. So cancellations would not be surprising. It's not a guarantee, but it wouldn't be surprising. And I think it's it's all but a guarantee that China shifts the vast majority of, of its business to Brazil. In fact, it's already happening. They're already booking Brazilian beans uh, for this February, March, April time slot. Now, this could change. This could change if Brazil ran into a big time crop problem. Um, I don't think people are leaning that way yet, but uh, you can never say that that is impossible by any means. So this is just some food for thought. And what I'm showing you here is nothing new. The fact that Brazilian beans uh, are cheaper than U.S. beans when you go out to February, March, April, that's not anything new. This is, this is old news, but I figured it might be useful for me to, uh, to illustrate that for you ahead of the holiday here. Uh, looking at corn... There's some different dynamics in corn. I still think the trade expects more Chinese corn business um, here to the U.S. It, the market seems to be acting that way, at least. I mean, they've, the, the dips in this market have been bought. Um, it certainly feels like there's some other factor at play here that's helping to support these prices. And, and maybe this chatter regarding uh, additional Chinese corn purchases is, in fact, true. And maybe we see it confirmed at some point in time. Um, there are, is also some talk surrounding the possibility of an even smaller U.S. crop, the idea that USDA could come back down um, with their production estimates again um, when we get into uh, this December report, which will be out on December 10th. It, it's really not normal for USDA to make any big changes after like October, but they made a big change in November this year. So I guess there's no rule that says that they couldn't make a big change in December. It's it's definitely possible. I'm not going to say it's, it's impossible uh, by any stretch. So I think that that's uh, something to keep an eye on as well. I think that there are traders out there who believe that USDA might in fact come down again with that uh, uh, production number for the U.S., 
Uh, we had our weekly ethanol report out today, and I think that this ethanol deal is uh, something you've got to keep an eye on in, in regard to corn. I mean, we haven't you haven't heard much about it recently because it's a bearish factor in a market that's been in nothing but bull territory for months now. But uh, gasoline demand this week, and these numbers just came out here a little bit ago. This is the lowest uh, weekly gasoline number since. Let's see, you got to go all the way back to um, like June. Uh, to find a number this soft. So I think that this resurgence in the COVID deal, this spike in cases is um, is hurting gasoline demand. And this is something that could ultimately hurt ethanol. And there are a lot of people out there who think that USDA may have to, to trim some off of its uh, projection for corn usage via ethanol. So I don't, I'm, I'm optimistic about the COVID situation. It sounds like these vaccines are promising. You look at a lot of the outside markets and, and things that are going on there. But um, this gasoline thing is troubling, and uh, it could certainly hurt the corn market if it gets bad enough. If we get back into a situation where the ethanol production just isn't there. And we actually had a really good, uh, a better weekly ethanol number uh, this week. This was actually the best print that we've seen uh, in weekly ethanol production dating back to, um, you know, the spring, dating back to March, basically. But um, it could go right back the other way real quickly if if the wrong things happen with this COVID deal. So a, a lot is really hinging on what sort of economic activity we see, what sort of gasoline demand we see, um, all of that stuff as we move into the end of the year. I know that the, the, a lot of markets seem to be optimistic. I mean, we had record high closes in the Dow yesterday, uh, record high closes in the S&P. Uh, those markets are holding together very well, but the stock market is, is not necessarily uh, the best gauge of the US economy. When it comes to wheat, I think that um, weather here in the US is still a big deal. And we know that we've still got drought in place um, in a lot of these U.S. HRW wheat areas, and we uh, we saw crop ratings drop again uh, this week, and and that was actually not expected. And and the national decline in crop ratings was driven almost entirely by uh, declines in these HRW states: Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, uh, Colorado, Nebraska. There's really not a ton of uh, relief in sight in the weather forecast. The next couple of weeks, I think a good chunk of Oklahoma is going to see some rain, but but like this Oklahoma panhandle, Texas panhandle area, a lot of Kansas, a lot of Nebraska, most of Colorado is going to stay dry. So I think that that's supportive, but at the same time, demand for wheat, uh, for U.S. wheat is just really terrible. Uh, export sales have not been good. We had a marketing year low in export sales last week. So you've got some different forces uh, pushing and pulling at the wheat market, certainly. Um, fund length, I think, is an issue in all of the markets. And I'm going to show you this chart, and I've showed you these charts in the past. But this is the uh, combined fund position across corn, soybeans, and SRW wheat. And at yesterday's close, the private groups estimated that funds were net long 528,000 contracts across the complex. That's a number that you've only seen on a handful of occasions since modern record keeping began in 2006. So my fear here, of course, as we get closer to year end is that for some reason, or maybe for no reason, the funds decide that they want out of some of this stuff. They want to reallocate, they want to balance the books, they find a reason to liquidate. And uh, when you've got this hefty of a, of a fund position here, uh, that's always a risk, no matter the situation. I know that the fundamentals of the soybean market look really, really good. Um, I know that corn fundamentals have improved drastically, um, but there's always risk when the funds are this heavily long. There's, there's always that uh, risk there. Uh, last thing I wanted to talk about was the U.S. dollar. Uh, we haven't carved out any fresh lows this week, but if you were to see this thing come in next week and say, take out those lows from a couple weeks ago, and, and now you're talking like fresh two-year lows, if that were to happen, that would be a positive factor for these commodity markets. There's a lot of chatter about inflation, um, and, and you can't gauge inflation just by looking at the dollar. There's a lot of other factors here, but with all this stimulus, with the government printing more money, keep in mind that the simplest definition of inflation is just more dollars chasing the same amount of assets. And um, you know that's something that can, that can transcend all these markets. 
commodity markets, the stock market. I mean, everything from the price of a, of a car or truck to real estate, um, all that sort of stuff. So I think that inflation is a deal. The dollars is certainly not the only ga way uh, to gauge that. But uh, that's something we've got to pay attention to also and is certainly on my radar um, as we move into the holiday here. Hope everybody has a nice Thanksgiving. Um, uh, remember, I'll be back with more in that Good Marketing 101 series he here over the next um, couple of weeks. Um, if you need some help from me, shoot me an email to info at standardgrain.com. I, I talked to you about the subscription service. If you need some help with your grain marketing, make sure you check that out. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Uh, we will catch you on Friday.